Do you want to do more to make impact? How we serve others and our world is how we pay our rent for being here. So get ready to learn how you can make a difference by simply choosing to live and lead with a socially conscious mindset. In this episode of Passion for Impact, I'm speaking with Mike Desjardins, founder of Virtus. We're talking about grind to growth and the grit in between and how to start, level up and manage a socially conscious business in a way that is professionally and personally fulfilling and successful for yourself and your team. Ready to be elevated in your leadership? Ready to learn how you too can move from grind to growth? Here we go. This is the Passion for Impact podcast with speaker, trainer, and socially conscious advocate, Tricia Miltimore. Thank you for joining in. This is the Passion for Impact podcast, where we have one clear goal, to educate, empower, and elevate social consciousness in people, business, and teams. Be sure to subscribe to receive links to featured companies, people, and offers. To subscribe, visit www.passioniganiter.ca forward slash podcast. Let's talk about grind to growth. As givers, creators, activists, and ambassadors, it is easy to get sucked into a vortex of building, developing, and achieving that exhausts even the grittiest amongst us. So let's learn how to grow and manage a socially conscious business or organization in a way that is professionally and personally fulfilling and successful for yourself and your team. My guest today is doing just that. If you are feeling like the grind is taking over your growth and fulfillment, you need to hear today's conversation. As the heart of Virtus, CEO Mike is emotionally intelligent and driven. His core motivation is to make a difference in the life of others. That is to say, his passion is creating positive change for his colleagues, his clients, and community. With a Bachelor of Commerce from UBC Sauter School of Business, a CPHR designation, and over two decades of experience transforming businesses, he is a master in the realm of strategy and leadership development. I've listened to many of his podcasts and read his resources on the Virtus website, and I can say that he definitely is. From entrepreneurial business to large public companies and uh, public sector organizations, Mike focuses on driving return on investment in every client engagement. From 2010 to 2016, Mike sat on the board of directors for the Human Resource Management Association of BC, now CPHRBC. I know many of our listeners are part of that organization. Since 2017, Mike has been a member of the advisory board of Robinson Group. Mike focuses on strategy, growth, and vision for Virtus. Passionate about leveraging his team, he engages them in co-creating Virtus's future vision and determining their role in it. Above all, Virtus is his vehicle to empower leaders, both within the company and among their clients. Mike is passionate about skiing, yoga, running, CrossFit, and anything in the self-improvement bucket. I'm not sure where he finds the energy or the time. In his community, his focus is on what he can do for others, and he loves nothing more than spending time with his daughter and his wife. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you so much, Trisha. That's quite the introduction. <laughs> uh, it's funny you know, to it's listen cool. to 20 years of your life being being uh, encapsulated into an introduction. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm, I'm very excited about this conversation because I think people are going to be able to glean from it so much about your from your story that they can immediately implement either through their mindset for growth or even strategically mm-hmm. into their business and platforms. You said in the pre-interview form that Five words to describe yourself. Driven, empathetic, energetic, charismatic, and funny. Isn't this fun? Um, I wanted I want to kind of zone in on that empathetic part. What do you mean by that? And how does that show up in your life personally and professionally? Well, before I answer that direct question, I think it was difficult to come up with those words because I thought this sounds like I'm, I have to try to brag about who I am. And so what I did was I went back to some assessments that I'd have done 360s and I looked for the common themes. And those five words were the common themes that came up. And empathy has been something to answer your direct question that's been part of my life since I was young. I mean, I, you know, I remember my mother saying to me, you know, you were always curious about other people and you always deeply listened and you have this way of helping people clarify 
what's going on for them and helping them solve their problems, which I mean, traditionally today, that would be really the Socratic method that goes into a lot of executive coaching, right? Is the ability to help another person gain clarity around what's going on in their world. And the only way to do that is to be able to practice deep empathy. And the challenge with deep empathy, of course, is that, you know, if we haven't had the experience, then we might be just sympathizing with the person, um, but not really feeling what they're feeling through it, not to take on their feelings, but to truly understand and empathize where they're at. And I think the other challenge is that a lot of times when we're in conversation, we're not listening to understand, we're listening to reply. And there's a very big difference because if I'm listening to understand, then I have to let go of that kind of chatter that's going on in the back of my mind and and actually really hear the other person and not worry that that my response is going to go away. So if I'm sitting there thinking about what I'm going to respond and I'm like, oh, I just need that other person to stop talking because I have this really, you know, witty, pithy, smart, whatever. I have something to say. (laughs) And, uh, but the importance is actually deeply um, listening to what's happening for that person. And then when they're done and they feel like they're being heard, that next step about what it is that I want to say, it'll come. It always shows up. Like it, it, and it might be quite different actually than what I would have responded to had I been stuck with that theme and it might not have actually been valuable for that person to have heard that, right? They might not have, they might have felt like, oh, well, you know, a lot of times people can tell when you're not, when you're listening to reply versus you're listening to um, deeply empathize and understand what's going on with another person. That is very true. So how do you use empathy as a leader yourself? I mean, it's, it's really the same thing. It, empathy is, is truly being willing to, uh, you know, to say you're putting yourself in another person's shoes is difficult because I don't think that's actually ever possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a worldview that I operate in. And that worldview, I, you know, I'm 48 years old. I'm a white male. I'm a CEO. I'm an entrepreneur. I live in Vancouver, BC, Canada. You know, I went to, you know, I went to UBC. I went to Vancouver College, uh, which is a private boys school before that. All of those things, like, you know, I, I do different types of sports. I see each of these things is influencing my worldview, right? So I have this view and I filter everything that I hear through that view. That can make it very difficult to be empathetic as a leader because I can be hearing with my ears and I need to hear with their ears. And so to be able to do that effectively as a leader, I have to understand, not for agreement, not to agree with another person's worldview, but I have to understand their worldview and how from their experience, from their life, how they see the world operates. And when I can do that, then I get a better chance of being able to support them and for them to to feel heard and understood, um, even if ideologically, we fundamentally disagree on the topic that we're talking about at the time. I love that. So you're the the power of being heard. We hear that again and again with people that that's truly what they're searching for. I just want to be valued and heard. So you do this for your clients, obviously, and for yes. your team. A little bit yeah. later on, I want to kind of um, dive more into how you build a company like yours and maintain that culture and mm. that empathy and that level of care. But first, uh, tell me a little bit more about Virtus. How did it get started mm-hmm. and, and what do you offer so people have some context? Mm-hmm, sure. So, yeah, um, it's just, uh, so back in 2000, um, back in 99, sorry, 98, 99, I burnt out. I, I was in a, uh, you know, I was in a role where a company that uh, had uh, in second year university, a company approached me, I was working in a retail store. And the CEO of the overall company, which was a manufacturing company, they owned a bunch of retail stores, um, and they sold products across Canada the owner came to me and said, I want to support you in your education. Well, that ended up being, I will pay for everything for you to go to school until you graduate. And then I'd love for you to come and work at my company. And so I took that deal. And so I ended up being there for 10 years. And then around the time I was about 27, I was in La Jolla, California, and I, I blacked out on a business trip. And you know, I hadn't had anything to drink. I just woke up in the morning and I fell on the floor. Like I, I, everything went black and I was on the floor. And every time I tried to stand up, I thought, you know, I, 
something is not right. And I was in incredible shape. Like I worked out you know, six days a week, so I, you know, I, I looked the way I wanted to look all, I imagined that, you know, I was in this sort of pinnacle of my life. I'm the president of this company. I'm in great shape. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling all over the place for work, but, you know, I was deeply unhappy um, in that I had designed a life on paper and then I went and created that life. And I, I kind of got that life. Before. I wanted to have it by the time I was 30 and I was 27 and I had it, but here I am, you know, lying on the ground in, in La Jolla, California. And it, it took me a while to realize um, that I'd actually burned out because I was so young. And I thought, well, that's not possible. You can't burn out. That's something that, you know, people in their fifties do. And so um, got through that and I realized I've got to, I've got to rethink my life. And I wrote a list that was supposed to be a top 10 list, but it ended up being a top 15 list of the things my life was going to have in it. So I was going to walk to work. I was, wasn't going to travel for work. I was going to travel for fun. I was going to take my vacation at the time I had banked up, you know, months and months of vacation. Um, I'm going to see my family and friends on a regular basis. I'm going to hold down a relationship. Um, I'm going to live downtown Vancouver. So I had this list, but none of it was, I'm going to make this much money. I'm going to have this responsibility. I'm going to have this title. Like none of that was, Part of that um, conversation. There was a small piece of that goal set that was around owning at least 10% of what it was I was going to do next. And so with that in mind, I started looking at opportunities to change what I was doing. And it took me about a year and a half. And I, I bumped into sort of chatting with my father's ex-business partner, who is, you know, kind of as a side hobby, was running these peer groups. And the peer groups were peer groups for CEOs and executives, very similar to like a YPO or EO or a, a tech slash Vistage organizations. And, um, you know, he'd, re he'd retired, um, you know, both he and my father had retired when they'd sold the company that they, they uh, both owned. My father was a minority partner in it. And he said, listen, I've got this thing. I've got these groups. I've got a couple of them started. Do you want to be in it? And I said, sure, because I knew I was trying to search for what was next got into one of these CEO peer groups and then um, said to him a couple of months in, I said, like, you really, you got to remember to bill people and take this seriously. And, you know, you don't have, it's not a company. And so I kind of left him with that. I, thought, I, I think you could turn this into a business if you, if instead of just a hobby. And two weeks later, he called and he said, listen, if you think this is such a great idea, why don't you turn it into a business? <laughs> and he says, then, and I'll be your partner. And he's like, I have a couple other people. One's a, a branding lady and another's a facilitator. And, um, you know, we could each put in uh, uh, 25 grand um, and we could start this thing. And so that's what we did. And so, October, you know, I, I resigned September 1st of 2000 from being the president of the company I was, uh, manufacturing company I was running and um, that I had then ended up growing, growing all over North America, which is partly why I burnt out. And, uh, uh, and uh, October 1st, 2000. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, what are we now? October the 14th or 15th today. So. 20 years ago, uh, save for a couple of weeks, um, uh, decided to go down this road. And uh, the original plan with Virtus was to build these peer groups out for CEOs and executives. And so we had uh, like 11 of them in Vancouver and five in Toronto. And I was just opening one in Seattle after having flown back from Toronto and realized I was doing it again. I was on mm. the road for business. I didn't want to do that. Um, you know, I had to drive three hours to Seattle after just getting off a flight from Toronto. And I'm like, I don't want this life. And I realized that to grow the peer groups, they needed to grow in different cities. And to do it effectively, CEOs didn't want to talk to any of my salespeople. They wanted to talk to me. Um, and so, you know, I would close 60% of the CEOs I spoke to. And I had five different people on commission sales. And they were their closing rate was 16%. And oh, wow. so I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, well, great. So now it means I am now doing the business development, but I have to go to any place where these CEOs are. So if they're in Calgary, I got to get on a plane and go to Calgary. I don't want to do that. And I've lived that life of a road warrior. And uh, I know it was a key part of my burnout. And so, and, and me not living the life that I wanted. And so I, I you know, decided that it, I need to change this business. I bought out, I actually tendered a buyout offer for myself uh, to my uh, to to my partners, and uh, two of my partners flipped it on me, and they said, "No, you buy us out." Um, <laughs> and you're right; we probably need to pivot this thing, but it looks like a lot of work, and we'll stick around and work in the business, but you buy us out. 
And so that left me with one partner. Um, 2006, I really kind of had the strategy nailed down and uh, uh, to pivot into leadership development and strategy, which is 90% of our work is today is leadership development and 10% of it is strategic planning, long-term strategic planning engagements that go on for like 10 plus years. And so um, uh, really in earnest, uh, we were moving into that, I would say into 2007. And end of 2007, uh, the last business partner I had, who was a facilitator, said to me, um, I don't understand this work we're going into. He also had fallen out of favor with the team. And so he's like, I, I don't feel like I'm respected here. I don't understand the work we're doing. You need to buy me out. And so that process took about uh, seven or eight months to complete. Finished in March of 2008, same month I met my now wife, um, Sabrina. And then uh, if, if everybody's playing the home game, um, buying your partner out in March 2008, while you're pivoting your business away from your subscription revenue business and moving into a new area where nobody knows you and you're not known for leadership development and strategic planning. And then September 2008 hits mm. and the recession is in. Now, you know, it, it really, I would say um, the hardest part of the recession hit us between probably March of 2009 and call it mm, well really December of 2009 um, and we can talk a little bit about the the, the 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 what happened December 2009 later but that that was kind of the 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 growth pattern and then since um you know we we barely survived uh the the December 2009 if it weren't for one client who pre-wired us money to do some work in 2010 and she said I got to get this off my budget um, and if I don't spend it, I lose it. So can I send it to you now? And it has to hit your bank account by December 24th. And which was great news because I was in, I had maxed out my debt carrying capacity and I had payroll on Christmas day for 20 people and I didn't have the money. Wow. And, yeah. and so I'm sitting there, you know, talking to who Sabrina, who was my fiance at the time. And I said to her, I, I don't know what to do. I, 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 this is the sickest irony. I, I don't have payroll on Christmas day. Like, you know, not making payroll is one thing, but not making payroll Christmas day. I mean, that's just, you know, like what is the universe trying to tell me here? And um, so this client pre-wired the money and, and after pre-wiring the money, uh, there was 6,000 left, but then a mountain of debt. And another client was uh, uh who we've been chatting with so what the first client is Fordith and the second client is Telus so Telus had been chatting with us and and uh I've been chatting with the chief learning officer who's now become a very close friend uh Dan Pontefract and he said well, we're going to do an RFP um I'd love your help in crafting it so that we make sure it's you know solid for all the vendors who are applying um well so we went on and Fordith from pre-wiring us that money ends up then doing a contract uh, with us that's 10 times that value. Two months later, we win the TELUS RFP, and that then ends up being six years of work. Fortis is nine years of work. Uh, because we had that, we also got Cactus Club. Then we got BC Hydro. That ended up being a six-year relationship. And those four brands really helped to establish us in the leadership development space as a serious player. And then we we went for kind of like a, uh, we just kept growing every year, you know, st pretty steady growth. And then one year we grew 36%. So that was a big blip. And it, it's now to a business in 2020. And we work with companies across Canada that are enterprise size organizations, you know, small would be kind of 50 million revenue and up. You see the average is probably closer to like five to 750 million in revenue. And we are supporting them on leadership development from the CEO uh, VP, director, manager, and high potentials. It's we, We're very good at customizing the work. Uh, and the thing that I'm really proud of, uh, two things, is um, one, that our customers at some point in conversation with us, they use the word love. They say, we mm -hmm. love working with you guys. And as soon as they say that, we're like, yes, we got the gold standard um, in, in our space for us. Uh, and the other thing is that we've tracked our likelihood to recommend. Uh, so all of our clients, we ask them, how likely would you be to recommend this program that you're in with Virtus to someone else that's a colleague uh, within your organization? And our average for the past three and a half years is nine out of 10. And in our industry, eight is great. And nine is like no one shoots for nine and that's our average. And so I'm, just, I'm very proud of our team 
and it's this business that we've built together that it's able to really deliver on the promises that we make uh, to our clients. I'm going to stop talking because that was a long period of time for me to share a story that goes over 20 years. Um, so I want to turn it back to you, Tricia. Well, I think it just provides great context to know, you know, how you're playing in the game right now. So people can either aspire or see where they fit so they can take that much more out of your stories as well. So when you were in that moment of life, when you have 20 people who you need mm. to pay and mm -hmm. you have uh, your debt load is very high and you're building this business in between grind and growth is grit. Yeah. Where did you... <laughs> get that grit from word and how did you maintain it because i i know a lot of people listening are in that space right now what would what advice or what would you share with them for that for those moments yeah it's a great question partly i'm wired that way there is a dark side to be wiring to be wired this way if you're a person who's wired for grit you'll keep going at well past the point that in which it's healthy to keep going <laughs> because you're wired that way. So for me, going to the gym is not an issue of motivation. It's an issue of stopping myself from going. So if I sign up to go to a CrossFit class, um, or like this morning, I was on a Peloton with a friend of mine, I will be there. No matter how I feel, I will show up for that. That's probably not the best decision one out of 50 times. That's one out of 50 times, I should probably just stay in bed and rest. And that same type of discipline and grit goes into business. And so one of the challenges can be is that continually to, you know, to push the rock uphill, as heavy as it gets, I'll keep pushing. And when other people are letting their rocks go, I'm just going to look over and then I'm going to keep pushing harder. Maybe I have the wrong rock mm. and yet I keep pushing. And that's the dark side of grit. So I know like Angela Duckworth's book on grit, I think it's fantastic because it really talks about how to instill it into children. I think it's important, like everything in life, you know, the yin and the yang is to think about, well, what's the dark side? What if you are gritty? What if you are a hyper-motivated, ambitious, persistent person? Like those are qualities I have. I can't help it. It's just how I show up in the world. But the dark side of it is that it, it, can, it can actually cause you to put too much effort in the wrong direction. And so the ability to step back and to be thoughtful about what vision looks like and what strategy looks like to get yourself out of the, cause grit can end up leading you into like groundhog day, right? Where you're kind of like, or feeling like you're on a hamster treadmill. And so if you're out there right now and you're listening to this podcast and this is resonating with you, it may be time to take a step back and rethink about why are you, why are, why am I even doing this? Like, what is the vision of what I'm trying to create? Not just for my business, but what kind of life do I want to have? Like, what is the life I want to live? Now, how do I want to show up as, as a husband or as a wife or as a partner? How do I want to show up as a dad or, you know, as a, a, a as the parent of a, of a child or as a friend or like, how do I want to show up in this world? And what I want to leave behind is the legacy of, 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 of who I was. And so for me, um, in 2008, my mentor um, got me practicing two habits. Uh, so I mentored Walt Sutton, and he's been my mentor for 16 years. And we've met for half a day a month for 16 years. And he's been just phenomenal in being in the background with me, having my back this whole time. And in 2008, he said, I think it would be a good idea for you to consider journaling. And I think it would be a good idea for you to pick up meditation. Because the stress of being an entrepreneur, you know, there's great things that come with being an entrepreneur. You get a lot of flexibility. You get to kind of like, for the most part, set in your schedule and you, have, you can have a lot of freedom. But there does come with a lot of responsibility and you're carrying the risk of the whole business. And so he said, I, you know, that weight, particularly during the, re the recession, he said, I think it would be two good practices for you to add in. And so I did. I, I started meditating and I still do today five or six days a week, I meditate and I journal every business day of the week, I journal. And those two practices have been incredibly helpful. But even with those practices in place, I still can easily fall into the trap of thinking this just needs more hard work. And I, mm -hmm. I have an endless supply of hard work. And, and that's where the dark side of that can be, um, can lead me to a place of feeling tired or exhausted or burning myself out. And so you know, I now being the age that I am, I can look back and say, yeah, sure. The situation I was in, you know, did help contribute to me burning out. 
But at the same time, wherever, you know, the phrase, wherever you are, wherever you go, there you are. So what's inside of me that gets me to that place of burnout, um, which turned out, by the way, to be partly genetic. And I managed to tackle that. <laughs> has to do with a gene mutation that makes me more likely to suffer from uh, uh, adrenal failure uh, than the average person would. Oh, okay. um, So that's a big part of it. And I had to go through a bunch of G uh, DNA testing and all this stuff back in 2011. And that was a long road because I ended up burning out again after I got the company and like, you know, out of the recession and saved and paid all the debt back, I burnt out again, but it, it turned out it was genetic. And it probably went to when I was 20, well, no, for sure. When I was 27, it was as well. So I have a handle on that. But what the problem is, guess what happens when you fix the physical side? Now I have more resilience. Give me a bigger rock and a bigger hill because I got more grit now. <laughs> and again, for me, that's my dark side, right? Is that um, I have the physical capacity, like I do CrossFit, I Peloton, I run, I ski, like I do all these like, you know, really heavily active driven things that give me a lot of stamina and physical, physically I can take on a lot, but maybe that's not the right path of, of being gritty. Maybe being reflective is what's actually more important at this stage in my career. It's actually where I'm at right now is of, of moving into a place of being uh, more reflective about the long term. What's the next 10 years of my business going to look like? And what's the next pivot? Because that's exactly what my where my head is from a vision perspective right now. Right. I love that. I think sharing that there's a dark side to the grind and the grit is just is a necessary conversation that entrepreneurs and those who have that kind of tenacity need to have with themselves. And do you find having that mentor or that person around you, maybe even family members to help keep you in check? Do you, do you utilize those kind of people for that? Yeah, I think the challenge with, I think it's good to have other entrepreneurs around. I think mm -hmm. that they're the only people who will ever truly understand what you're going through. And if you have a mentor and you're an entrepreneur, you want to have an entrepreneurial mentor because they can truly understand the pressures you're under. Family members will never get it unless they're an entrepreneur. They will never understand the pressure. They will under, never understand the stress. They can try, but the best they could do is sympathize with you. The only people that can empathize are the ones who've been in your shoes directly and know what it's like. You know, we always joke in my forum that a cash flow crisis, if you're payroll and you can't make payroll and your payroll is 10 grand, or your payroll is a million dollars, you either have it or you don't. The amount of zeros is irrelevant. And mm -hmm. so we talk so much about the stress in, in, in each of our businesses. And you know, some of the businesses are in the hundreds of millions of dollars in my in my form group. And you know, when something happens in their business, the same thing can happen in my business. And my business is smaller than theirs. Same problem, right? Yeah. But we relate to the fact that we know what it's like to be the one who has to fix that problem and carries the weight of the decision long term and the consequences of those actions. And so, you know, like Sabrina is amazing. Like she's like, I, I, I won the wife lottery. Best decision I ever made in my life was um, marrying my wife, Sabrina. And honestly, the best thing that's ever happened in my life is the birth of my daughter. And that is a direct reflection or a direct result of the decision I made, obviously, to marry Sabrina. And she's incredibly supportive. And, you know, she always says to me, do anything you want to do. I got your back. And she's like, I just want you to be happy. I want you to be happy. Um, uh, and she's like, you know what, we, you know, Lily and I are here for you. And, you know, you, you're very generous with us and you take care of us. So, you know, we're here to take care of you because it gets hard sometimes, right? Like we're in the middle of COVID right now and it makes business uncertain. A lot of businesses aren't going to survive. You know, we've been very lucky. You know, I, I took the lessons from 2008, nine in terms of cut fast, cut deep, take all the subsidies, take all the loans, any program that's available, sign up for it right away. Basically over uh, overdue. So in the recession, what I learned is it's going to take twice as long to get through the recession that anybody thought, including the media. And it's going to be twice as hard. So I knew that when COVID hit, I'm like, well, everybody thinks this is going to be done by September. And I think it's going to take at least an, a year or a longer, probably a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I... I, I, we did our cash flow forecasting. We did our budgeting. We did everything based on a worst case scenario because I know what happened in the recession. And I had the learnings of reflecting on the decisions that 
I made and that we made as a team uh, to be able to survive that and be around. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if you if you figure out a way to get through, then you, you get another try, right? Like if, if you can right. just figure out how to get through it. For most entrepreneurs, that's cash flow. Don't worry about like a revenue profitability. Do you have cash? Cash is oxygen in an entrepreneurial business. You know, revenue is vanity. Uh, profit is sanity, but cash flow is oxygen. And if you're going to pick between those three things, pick oxygen first, you know, figure out your cash flow and, and be able to map that out as far out as you can see, and then do everything you can to protect that cash flow. Because you can go fix your revenue and you can go fix your profitability on the other side of that. And obviously left too long. If you don't have revenue and profit, you're not going to have more cash. So that's, you know, they're connected. But if job one is protect your cash flow, then job two is go figure out your revenue model. And, you know, if you've got a profitable business, great. If you don't, then you need to look at your costs, your operating expenses of your business, and you need to look at your margins. And that's it. Like, protect all of that to pull yourself through the situation. And, uh, and, then, and then you're alive to decide what you're going to do next. And, you know, uh, that, that's really what I think the, the, the challenge is for entrepreneurs who are living through what... For a lot of them, you know, if you're a younger entrepreneur and you didn't get the opportunity, and I know that's going to sound weird to say it that way, but if you didn't get the opportunity to survive the 08 recession um, or go through the 99 tech boom, uh, bust, sorry, then you, you won't have, you won't have experienced what it's like and know what it's like to be on the other side of that and have that reflection. If this is your first time having an economic event, this one happens to be tied to a pandemic, but so what? It's the same outcome. You know, if you're, it's your first time going through this, you're going to learn a lot. Just be prepared for it to last twice as long as your worst case scenario. And so that's the best way to plan uh, through something like this. Mm, love that. Such a good advice. So being an entrepreneur is not easy. Uh, being a socially conscious entrepreneur adds mm. all kinds of other levels to the game. Mm -hmm. You have chosen, this is one of the things I just really admire about you and Virtus and your team is that you've taken on this role. You're, you're B Corp certified. You went down that journey, which no doubt took energy, time, uh, resources. Heart. <laughs> yeah. Heart? Heart? Hard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, where did that start? Like where did, what point in your business were you like, okay, this is what matters to me and this is how the road I'm going to go down. And, and what has that journey been like? Well, so we were stand we were sitting in a house, this really cool um, mid-century modern home that the operations team and I had decided to rent in Palm Springs. And we were doing our annual, so once a year we go away for a week and we do our annual creative strategic planning session. Um, and we basically map out the business future uh, from a strategic standpoint. So we're sitting there in Palm Springs. We're in this really cool, funky, mid-century modern house. Got this awesome pool outside. And, you know, we were making dinners together. And and uh, somebody's playing bartender at, at 4.30 every day. And um, somebody else is DJing. And it's just a, it's like a super fun environment to be in. And somebody on the team who's a head of business development said, I would like to work for a company that stands for something. And the rest of us were like, yeah, of course. You know, she was relatively new to the team. I said, well, agreed. Like, we do stand for something. She's like, yeah, I know, but we say that on the website, but like, how do we prove it? How do we prove we we stand for this mission, this this thing we've decided, which is to make a diff our purpose, right? To make a difference in the lives of others. Like, and like, who are these others? So we mapped out all of our stakeholders that were affected, and it turns out that there's about a 25 times multiple for every leader that we develop. So if you if we develop a leader and they become a better communicator, they become a better listener, they become better at typical conversations, they're more empathetic, they're stronger in their emotional intelligence, they're like all of these skills that, that make you better as a leader, turns out it makes you better as a person. And so who's affected by that? So we realize, well, you know, okay, if they have a partner, so that's one person. You know, on average, 2.1 children. So maybe they have a brother or sister. So that was another person. They have mom and dad. Okay, well, there's two more people or four. And we said, well, they're a leader. So they have like, maybe they have an average of five people reporting to them. So there's five more people. So we just kept doing that. Like how many friends, how many close friends do they have, right? Like, do they belong to an association? How many people do they like, do they play sports? So we looked at that and we realized okay, there's probably 25 different people that are stakeholders in Virtus 
that don't realize they are because they're influenced directly by how that person we're working with as a leader has changed and how they're modeling a different way to be in the world. So we, we mapped all these stakeholders, we mapped out the benefits that each of these stakeholders would get. And we said, okay, how do we, how do we certify this in some way? And uh, a friend of mine, Bernie Geis, um, who helped get the Benefit Corp legislation through in the province of British Columbia, had told me about um, B Corp. And he, because he had uh, taken his insurance business and estate planning business and made it a B Corp. So he sent me the book, E. Schwenard's book, Let My People Surf. So that's a founder of Patagonia. And so I gave it to my head of business development and she read it. She's like, I love this. That's what we should do. So we tried to go down the road ourselves for the first kind of like you know, six months, maybe a year. And it's not an easy process to go through if you don't have support. Luckily, about you know, partway into it, we managed to meet a woman by the name of Christy O'Leary from a company called Decade Impact. And Christy and her team, they actually guided us through the process. So she, she is somebody that helps socially conscious businesses figure out how to really bring that social consciousness into their whole business, build their strategy around it. And then if you want to go down the road of becoming B Corp certified, guide them through that process. So that took a process that's taken us a year at that point. We meet Christy. Six months later, we're um, B Corp certified, which was um, December of 20, 2019. No, sorry, December of 2018. So we're a couple of years uh, into our B Corp certification. And for us, it was really, um, hey, somebody out there can audit us that proves that all the things that are nice things that we stuck on our website, they're actually true. <laughs> like we, we mean these things and that they're, they're at the core of who we are. And then we doubled down when Black Lives Matter hit. We looked at ourselves and said, well, you know, this is going to become part of our social mission as well. We are going to, we teach all these leaders across these large organizations across Canada. And the only way to get rid of systemic racism is to make sure that the leaders think it's something that's worth getting rid of, that anti-racism needs to be a choice. Not being racist is not a thing. That's not helping anybody. Being anti-racist, that's going to make change happen. But we didn't even know where to start, you know, and, and we don't have, you know, as a team, um, we're mostly Caucasian as a team. And now we are 16 women and four men. So we are heavily, uh, uh, you know, weighted on, on having more women in our company. So we have that level of diversity. So we ended up taking a program called Whiteness at Work, which is from the Attaway Group in the U.S. Um, and we are doing a, and then leading from that, we've changed three systems so far in our business um, to remove the chance of systemic racism. And so we've done that. And then we've got the whole company going through uh, the book, uh, Me and White Supremacy, which starts, well, actually start, started yesterday to guide all of our, uh, our entire team, so including our facilitators, on the actions we are taking and what it means to be anti-racist in 2020. And this is like, honestly, this is 400 years. This should have happened 400 years ago, but it didn't. And so it's happening now. Black Lives Matter propelled it. And we decided that instead of, you know, putting a thing on Instagram and, you know, making it look like, you know, basically like blackwashing, really, we don't want to do that. What we want to do instead is like actually make the real change inside our own business to, to show and lead the way and model what it looks like to be anti-racist. And when we're good at it and we feel like we can at least share what we've done and our understanding and the language we're changing, because there's so many terms that like the word godfather or grandfather, for instance, is a super racist term. So we've got you know a whole dictionary of terms that we just don't use anymore and that we're teaching leaders not to use. Once we've done all of that, then we're going to go forward and start with our clients to support in their leadership programs to be more active around uh, this conversation. Right now, we're referring them to people like the Attaway Group to support their uh, learning what anti-racism looks like. But for us, first, we needed to learn. Then we needed to take action. Then we needed to model. And then the last step of it is to uh, make sure we're sharing that. So our social has got it all over it. We're providing resources to people. The podcast I did with Yobom Gilpin Jackson, who is a, a PhD in um, in organizational development, 
She's also the chief human resource officer of BC Lottery Corp. I reached out to her and I said, um, I just learned about being an, uh, an advocate and amplifying. And I, and I read this in Me and White Supremacy. I have this podcast. I, you know, I have leaders across Canada that I have access to. Can I interview you? Like, can I have a conversation with you as a black woman, as a black leader? Tell me about your experience. Like, cause you're writing about it. I want to amplify your message. And so that podcast was all about me trying to amplify, but also come forward in my own vulnerability and express for me, um, you know, I'm not perfect. I've said racist comments. I've, you know, laughed at racist jokes. I've like, I'm, I'm part of the problem. I'm a 48 year old white male, right? So it was a CEO. So I need to be out there showing what real change looks like and advocating and amplifying. And so that was the purpose of, of, um, of doing that. It's actually been the most watched, most listened to podcast of this series so far. So I'm super grateful uh, that I was able to get that message out in service of that. So, you know, we started on this B Corp uh, train thinking like, okay, well, it's good. It, it helps, you know, what, what we believe in the world and it helps us be audited. But then when Black Lives Matter came, it was like, we just have to integrate this in because it just, it's the, well, it's the right thing to do. And I, you know, I wanted my daughter who's eight, I want her to look back on this. And when I tell stories, as I'm telling them to you right now, um, and, and I've been telling her these stories as, as uh, uh, you know, in the last year, um, and particularly in the last six months, that uh, that's something that she can look back on and know that her dad and the people that work in, in Virtus didn't stand by and say, yes, that was, it's right, we should fix this, but instead mm-hmm. took action on how to fix it. That is very inspiring, the integration from the inside out in your company and taking that vulnerable stand, because it is, it does feel like you're, you know, so I, I did listen to your interview with, with her. I'm sorry, what was her name again? Yeah, boom. Thank you. And that was in your podcast series of Conversation with Leaders. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's available at virtusinc.com. If anyone is interested, a great series there, Conversation with Leaders with Mike. It's so powerful to be able to have these conversations and get those insights. And so just I'm super inspired by that. What she had to share was very enlightening. And so mm-hmm. I just want everyone to listen to that. I agree. It was a really powerful conversation. So you're B Corp certified. You've grown this company to this place. You have a full team of people who are passionate and invested in the mission, the values, the the, the process, the journey. How do you help your team members to focus on growth over grind as well, continually as they as they go through their own evolution too? Well, interesting. When we first went, so we're a virtual business, um, remote, you know, work from home company. We have been since 2009. So when COVID hit, wasn't really a big shift for us. So mm-hmm. maybe I'll go back in time to when we did go uh, virtual at the first in in September 2009. Six months later, the whole company was almost burnt out. And this is the thing that I think right now during COVID, we keep trying to tell companies this that your culture is going to be heavily affected if you don't teach leaders how to show up in a remote workspace. Like you don't teach them how to lead remotely. Six months in, you're going to run into a mental health crisis and a burnout factor. It's coming. And if it hasn't hit, it's starting to hit in COVID right now. So we know right now the calls are going to, they've already started, but the calls are going to start coming big time. What happened for us is, you know, we did in 2009. Nobody was virtual in 2009. We were one of the very first companies in the world, really, that was going this way. And we didn't know that that was a thing. We didn't know that when you started working from home, you have no boundaries. <laughs> you don't, you know, you start work when you start your commute normally, and you end when you would have ended your commute. You forget to take lunch. You forget to take breaks. You work on the weekends. You just quickly peek at your laptop for three hours from seven to 10 at night. Like, we got to become this always on business and that was never the intention behind going into a remote work from home environment. So one of the facilitators actually interviewed all of us and we each came up with a personal plan around what wellness was going to look like. And then we had to establish our own personal boundaries, right? And as a company, we had to establish boundaries as well. It's easy when you're in an office, right? Because people are either there or they aren't there. When there is no office, you just can text somebody or call them or Slack message them anytime you want. Mm-hmm. Is Should I reply right away? I mean, it just popped up on my phone. It's out of working hours, but it's on my phone. I could just do a quick reply. And then it's like, oh, that quick reply leads to a phone call at nine o'clock. It leads to Sunday nights at 830. 
it leads to Saturday morning at 10. Like it, all of a sudden it just, it just expands. And so, you know, we as a company needed to set up parameters around work so people wouldn't feel guilty. I remember one of the team members, I think it was Nadia, who's our head of instructional design. I think it's her. She wrote on Slack at seven o'clock at night. I'm just running out to grab a quick bite to eat, but I'll be back in 30 minutes. And I read that. And I'm like, what? It's seven o'clock at night. Why are you writing that? And I realized, oh my God, we've created a culture where people actually think they need to check in at seven o'clock at night when they're going to grab a bite to eat for 30 minutes. We don't work at seven o'clock at night, <laughs> right? Like, why is that happening? And so that was really the, one of the alarm bells that, that sent us down that road. So now today, we, you know, we, we definitely, for leadership, preach self-responsibility. But we have to teach people what, what setting appropriate boundaries look like. So you can tell people be self-responsible. That's nice. But then you don't teach them how to do it, you know, how they're going to succeed. We have to teach leaders how to empathize with the home situation. Mm-hmm. If you're in COVID, you may be single and introverted. And you've been training for this your whole life right? You could be single and extroverted and be very lonely through COVID. You could be in a relationship that's great. You've got a supportive partner. There's a lot of people who are trapped in relationships that aren't great and they're trapped at home with that person now. And work, work may have been their escape and they don't get that anymore. There's people with one, you know, families that have one kid, two kid, three kid, four kids that are trying to figure out how to do online schooling or part-time in-person schooling and lead two careers at the same time in a house that does that has one den and six people trying to figure out where they're going to learn or work or whatever. So everybody's personal situation is going to be quite different. And so for leaders to truly deeply understand what's happening in people's worlds and then adapt and change your work processes to allow for people to to work in a way that works best for them. And that might not look anything like what it looked like when they were working in an office. And so it goes to what Ricardo Semler did with his company Semco in Brazil. And he went to a results only workplace, either ROE or ROW, which is focus on the results you're trying to create with people and don't worry so much about clock punching and worry about you know hours and that sort of thing. Focus on, are they able to achieve the results? If they've got to drop their kids off at school or help their kids get ready for homeschooling, and maybe they can't start work until 9.30. Maybe they like working early in the morning, right? Because if they get up before their kids get up and they feel good about doing a workout and getting some work done, but then between you know eight o'clock and 9.30, they're unavailable because they're helping their kids get ready for school that day. Maybe they got to pick up their kids at three o'clock. I mean, one of the weirdest things we do as society is we send kids to school at three o'clock and we tell people they have to work till five. Well, Mm -hmm. how's that going to work? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense, right? In a work from home environment, you know, be flexible with people and say to them, hey, you you get, you, you work from home. So design the work schedule that works for you and take advantage of the flexibility. I always tell our team, um, you know, we get close to Christmas and Hanukkah go shopping on Monday at 10 a.m. And they're like, but that's the middle of the work day. And I'm like, yeah, but nobody's at the mall. (laughs) You know, take advantage of the fact that you work from home, take a couple of hours out and go go shopping. Because honestly, if you try to do that after work or on the weekends, the malls are a gong show. We're obviously moving into a, a, a more of an Amazon world now, but there's still lots of retail going on. But a lot of leaders, when I tell them this, their first thought is, oh, if I can't see people working, you know, they're probably home playing on Netflix. Like they were screwing around at the office already. Like they were already not being productive at the office. If you've got motivated, driven people, then whether they're in the office or at home, it doesn't make a difference. It really doesn't. You just thought they were working because they showed up in the place. It doesn't make a difference. So Mm -hmm. give them the trust and the respect that most people every day show up and they want to do a good job. How do we support them in accomplishing it? It's not common sense. Leaders have to be taught how to lead remote teams. They have to be taught how to lead in a hybrid environment. If you think that giving them a Zoom account and a laptop is going to save them, it just isn't. And just wait, because that burnout factor is is uh, is just around the corner uh, in, from a COVID perspective. Um, and we're about to hit holiday season. And if you want to know one of the toughest times for burnout, it's around the holiday season. And with COVID being, we'll be around nine months into COVID uh, when December hits. And we've got Hanukkah and Christmas and, and other holidays during that time, New Year's Eve, like, it, it's going to be a very, very interesting um, end of the year. And I don't mean to be a doomsayer when I say all these things. I say them prophetically to help support leaders in understanding where they need to put their time, attention, and energy right now. 
Mm -hmm. I think that's so powerful. You're right. It, leaders need to be taught these skills because right, it is not necessarily intuitive. And it's num the number one question I get in my own leadership leadership training company is the work life balance, and now of course mm. work life home and the expectations and as leaders, like how, do, how do they do that? I think this could be a whole nother podcast, essentially. <laughs> well, I have lots more good... to say on that topic, I'm sure from both of us. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? You also have some great resources on your website. So it's virtusinc.com. I've read some great blog posts that you have on there, being that you are a remote-based company. So I encourage everyone to get on there and check that out as well. Uh, gosh, I, there's so many things that I, I could just sit down for hours with you, Mike. There's such such gold coming out of you. Um, we do have to kind of wrap it up here, but I love to end on this note is if you could give yourself some advice uh, or perhaps the per and this could apply to the person who's starting out in their own social impact journey and creating a, a social enterprise and platform is what would be the number one piece of advice you would share? Okay, I think there's two questions in there. So I'll answer I, them I separately. just totally put two questions together. Yes. Okay. Advice for yourself. And then I yeah. guess I'm thinking it'll apply to anyone else who is just starting as well. <laughs> well, I think to, I think to myself 10 years ago, um, yeah. you know, because I have the hindsight now to know what happened right over the past 10 years is to uh, to, to stay very clear on uh, vision and purpose and, and why I'm doing this and to remember what I said earlier around the dark side of grit. Now that applies to me very personally in terms of being able to step back and get and be very clear on what it is that I want. And if what it is that I'm doing isn't working to really step back and just go a different direction. So that would be the advice I'd give myself. Um, in terms of advice for somebody who's, you know, in wants to be a socially, uh, a social conscious entrepreneur, socially conscious entrepreneur, Interestingly, you may be the only person that believes in you for a long time. It's quite mm -hmm. possible that there'll be a lot of detractors in your life, friends, family care about you, but are seeing you struggle to figure out your way in the world, in your business. And entrepreneurship is not a straight line. You start off and you have an idea and maybe it's the wrong idea. And you got to pivot. That's okay. Um, the only thing is you got to, you got to keep going. Like the, it'll, it'll come it just, sometimes it just takes time and flexibility and the willingness to, to, to willingness to have flexibility, to adapt and change based on the information that you're getting. Cause entrepreneurship is a lot like testing. So you're testing something out. Did that work? Did people like it? No. Well, okay. Well, maybe that's not the thing. Maybe it's the wrong audience. And so you're constantly testing. And for other people who are watching at you, all they see is a bunch of failure. What they're missing is that you know, uh, is it, um, it, you know, in, in, in uh, coming up with the light bulb, right? It was a whole bunch of failures, right? I think it was 120 failures towards coming up with light bulb. Now the 121st time it became a light bulb and it turned on, but all the way along, anybody who was watching the team that was working on creating a light bulb, because it was a team of, of engineers that were, that were together, even though only one person is credited with it, that team was failing the whole time. And so if you're looking at that in your friends and family, like maybe you should just go and make a better candle because this is clearly not working. And that's what entrepreneurship can feel like sometimes. And if you believe in your heart that the social mission that you have is important, then how you're going to achieve that may change over time. Just don't give up on the mission itself because you haven't figured out how to accomplish it yet. If it was easy to do, then somebody else would have done it already. If it's worthwhile doing, and it's probably going to be hard to figure out, that's okay. Just give yourself the time to figure it out. And that is some powerful wisdom. Thank you, Mike, for sharing your energy and your stories and all about Virtus and the journey. Uh, I know people are going to take a lot from this interview. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Trisha. I appreciate you for you making the time to have me on your podcast. And uh, I'm super curious to know in the comments, um, if you're, you've listened to this podcast, what I'd love to know is what resonated with you? What was the thing that Trisha and I talked about that most resonated with you? Type it in the comments below. Um, I'll definitely reply. I'm sure Trisha's going to be in there replying as well. And of course, as always, uh, make sure to subscribe so that you're getting other episodes of uh, Trisha's podcast so you can listen to more people uh, that come on here and share the war stories, the good, the bad, the ugly that we've had to go through so that if you're at the beginning of your journey, you don't have to make the same mistakes that the rest of us made along the way. Very true. Thanks, Mike. 
Thanks, Trisha. Have a great day. If you love learning how to live and lead in a conscious and fulfilling way, and you find this show inspiring, please share with your friends, rate and review this podcast. Thank you for listening. Remember, cast your vote, make your impact one socially conscious choice at a time. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Passion for Impact podcast. Visit passionigniter.ca forward slash podcast to subscribe for episode notes, links and special offers from show guests. Cast your vote. Make your impact. One socially conscious choice at a time.